Ephesians chapter 6. It says, We are not fighting against flesh and blood enemies, but against evil rulers and authorities of the unseen world, against mighty powers in the dark world, and against evil spirits in heavenly places. Now, it's not talking about evil spirits in heaven where God is. There is no evil spirits where God is. Jesus went there with the, his blood and cleansed that uh, place of worship, that holy place, and there is no evil spirit there. But there is evil spirits in the heavenlies, in, the, in between us. And the, Paul talked about I was caught up to the third heaven, the, the, the area above us, the, the supernatural plane that is above us is where the enemy operates. And that's why you can't see him with your natural eyes. But just because you can't see your enemy does not mean he does not exist. And it does not mean that your enemy is not getting some good licks in on you. Only you know uh, how many times the enemy has overcome you or the enemy has lured you into a trap in which you have fallen and uh, lost hope and maybe even given up. There's no need to give up because you win. The blood of Jesus that we talked about earlier is never going to lose its power, and it's that blood that saved you. It wasn't because you decided to get saved. It was because the blood of Jesus was applied to your life by faith, and that's why you're saved today. So you're going to win no matter what. But you know, while we're in these earthly bodies, the enemy is in constant uh, uh, attack mode, trying to discourage us, trying to stop us from fulfilling everything that God has planned for us. The Satan knew that Peter had a plan on his life, and that's why he, he bothered Peter so much, and especially that last moment before Christ's res or, uh, death. Uh, Peter was tempted to, to deny Jesus, and he did. He denied the Lord. What was Satan trying to do? Prove he could get Peter to deny? No, he was trying to stop what happened on the day of Pentecost. Because on the day of Pentecost, Peter stood up and preached an earth-shattering message and thousands were saved and filled with the Holy Spirit that day. So Satan knows that, you have a, that God has a plan for you. And he, he knows that because God makes nothing without a purpose. And he makes nothing without a purpose that pleases him. So therefore, he can't touch God. So the only way he can affect God is to try to affect his children to stop the purpose of God from happening in our lives. So we're in a battle. Constantly, the Lord promises rest to us in that battle. He says, I'll, he says, I'll feed you. I'll, I'll set you down at my table in the presence of your enemies in Psalm 23. But one of the things I want to talk about, or the, the thing I want to key in on today is being prepared for the battle. Our military spends most of its time preparing for battles. I just watched a documentary last night on the, the SEAL Team uh, 6 that went after bin Laden. And... What they had done is uh, they found out the compound that bin Laden was in, and they didn't just rush in there and, and the next day. They literally spent months preparing for one raid that took less than 45 minutes. Months. They built an entire complex exactly like the one they were raiding, all the way down to which way the doorknobs turned. That was very interesting to me. And what was really interesting to me is how they got that kind of intelligence. But they, they were able to find out everything about that compound. So they built that compound in an undisclosed location. And these Navy SEALs for months, daily, over and over, would charge into it. They set up all kind of failures that could happen. And that's why when that chopper went down to the compound, not one Navy SEAL lost his life. They had another chopper right there to do the extraction. These guys were prepared for anything. We serve an enemy that the Taliban and the, and the terrorists get their inspiration from. His name is Satan. He's out to steal, to kill, and to destroy. And if you think they have a network, he has a much better one. And it is all about destroying the potential that lies in the believer. He can't destroy you. He can't come in and just wipe you out and smoke you. If he could, he'd do it. God has set parameters around him. That's why the scripture said there is no temptation that's not common to man. It also says there will be no temptation comes to you that you don't have the power to overcome. So yes, Satan is alive and, and he's out in the earth seeking whom he may devour. But listen, there's only some he can devour. There's some he can't devour. And that's what we want to become. We want to become Christians that when he bites and does, his teeth break out. I served under a pastor one time and he had, he had taken a church where they, they were known to eat preachers. Have you ever been to one of those churches? One guy told me, he said, you know why pastors, you know why shepherds carry staffs? He said, it's not for the wolves. He said, man, them sheep bite. It's to knock the sheep off of you when they attack. 
Well, this church was known to be one that just eats preachers. And when they met this one, they broke their teeth off in him. And he's still there to the glory of God. And the people that caused those problems are no longer there. They, they went away with bleeding gums, I guess. <laughs> but we must be prepared for battle. If, we're, if, if our military knows the seriousness of being prepared before they go into a situation like they did, and they did it successfully, then how much more should we understand that if we're in a war, which the Scripture declares we are, and we have an enemy, which the Scriptures declare we are, and there are mighty powers in dark places that we need to learn and to, and to uh, gather all the information we can, the intelligence we can about how the enemy operates. And we need to understand how we need to train and be prepared. I got news for you. Those Navy SEALs wasn't eating around eating bonbons and drinking Dr. Pepper uh, for the last six months just waiting for an assignment. They trained hard all the time. Thank God they do. If we want to be successful in the kingdom of God, if we want to hold back the enemy and even take his ground, then we've got to do the same thing. We have to train ourselves for battle. We can't just wake up every day like that old Doris Day song and say, que sera, sera, whatever will be, will be. And you know what? The devil, he's singing along to that tune because he likes that one. Because he says, wait till you see what I got planned for you today. And I'm so sneaky, the devil says, and I'm going to make you think that the, that the person in the church or your neighbor or your family member calls this problem. And all the time, I'm the one that's operating underlying in the incognito, undercover. That's how the devil loves to operate. He don't ever show up in a red suit and a tail. We'd know what to do with him. He masquerades as an angel of light. He masquerades as wisdom. But it's not true wisdom. It's an earthly wisdom. It's a demonic wisdom. But we have to be prepared for the battle. And as you well know by now, the mind is the place where our battles are won or lost. It is in your mind. Once it comes out into the natural, once it's being, be involving your body, it's involving your relationships, then it has already progressed past the mind. It is in the mind that we must grab hold of every uh, attack of the enemy and we must dispose of it quickly. Our mind is the place where battles are won or lost. And the mind must be renewed continually. Now, I love what Kenneth Hagin used to say. He would say, your, your mind won't stay renewed any more than your hair will stay combed. You have to make a decision every day to keep your mind renewed. In Ephesians chapter 4, verse 22, we're going to look at, and we're going to read through 24, we're going to look at what Paul wrote uh, to the church in Ephesus and what he was instructing them by the Holy Spirit to do. Listen to this. He said, throw off your old sinful nature and your former way of life. Throw it off. Now this isn't, this isn't talking about, uh, this isn't saying that you're not born again. This is the remnants of not being born again, the ways of thinking that we have to shed. Because as you well know, when you are born again, you're given God's nature on the inside and that old nature dies. So if the old nature is dead, what do we have problems with? We have a problem with the effects of that old nature because for all those years, and even after we get saved, those, that old nature, the thoughts and the ways of that old nature, they must be crucified. They must be put to death because you can take a pig out of a pig pen, but he's still a pig. Amen? He's still going to want to do what a pig does. Now, when your body, when, you're, when you got saved, your body most likely didn't want to start doing different. You had to train it to do different. Now, you had the will on the inside to do different. It's kind of like when you go on a diet, or I shouldn't say go on a diet. Everybody's on a diet. You do know that, right? People say, I'm on a diet. I look at them and go, looks like you've been on a diet for a long time. The problem is it's just the wrong diet. But when you get on, when you get on the correct diet, you have the want to on the inside, but on the outside and the taste buds and the watering of the mouth when you look at that that food that's got more calories than you need in a whole day in one plate, then you have to make a decision. Are you going to follow your want to on the inside or are you going to follow the outside want to? Now, when you got saved, the outside want to might have changed some, but it did not get completely renewed. That's not going to happen completely until the resurrection of these bodies. That's why Paul said, who shall deliver me from this body of death? Paul recognized that your body, the one you and I are in now, it's made out of the dust. And I got news for you, that dust got cursed. And that means everything made out of dust got cursed. So now we have to believe God for the blessing to overpower the curse in our bodies daily. But nonetheless, this body eventually is going to be done away with because it is corruptible. But that which is born of God is incorruptible. So your spirit man 
is whole before God. It's complete. It's not, it's not ever going to die. It's going to live forever. And it, we need to let that come out of us. That's why the scripture says, work out your salvation. You need to take what's on the inside and allow it to come out of you. That's how you work out your salvation. You don't work out your salvation by payment plan to Jesus to get saved. No, the payment was made on the cross. So you work it from the inside to the outside. So look at the next part of this. Instead, I'll start over. Throw off your old sinful nature and your former way of life, which is corrupted by lust and deception. Instead, let the Spirit renew your thoughts and attitudes. Put on your new nature, created to be like God, truly righteous and holy. Let the Spirit renew. I want you to understand something. The Holy Spirit is the, the one who's at work doing the renewing. That rhymed. That was pretty good, wasn't it? The Holy Spirit is the one who changes things in your life. This is why a lot of believers get disgusted and upset. They quit, their, they quit even trusting God anymore because they try to bring everything under control through self-will instead of saying, Father, I need your help and I need you to overcome this in me. I need you. I'm putting my trust in you. And when we do that, then we're letting the Spirit renew our thoughts. Our part is to meditate and to think about God's Word and God's way. And the Holy Spirit's part is to actually do the work as we cooperate. See, when we think about God's Word and when we put God first in our life, what we're doing is we're cooperating with the changing agent of the Holy Spirit. But it is clearly the Holy Spirit that brings the change. It's not us bringing the change. It is simply aligning ourselves in the right place at the right time for change to happen. Do you understand that? There has to be an alignment that takes place. There's many times Christians are living outside the blessing because they're out of alignment with God's will for their life. There are people today that are struggling financially and they just can't get on top. And the first thing I tell them is I say, check your financial alignment. Is God first in your finances? Is he the first thing you think about when you cash that check? Is your first thought, I'm going to take care of what God tells me to take care of first. And if it's not, then that means your finances are out of alignment. And when they're out of alignment, the blessing can't flow like God wants it to. God wants to bless his people abundantly. I got news for you. God wants everybody in this building to be highly successful and make a lot of money so that they can do the right thing with it. But I want to tell you something. Until everybody, until cooperatively, we decide that we're going to do the right thing with our money, then we're going to find God can't trust us with a lot of money. We have to be faithful with little. And a lot of times people think, well, when I get a, a lot, I'll be faithful. No, you won't. And that's why you're not going to have a lot, not God's way you won't. It's faithfulness to God that when we bring ourselves into alignment, this is what happens. God says, now I can trust you. Now I can trust you. I can trust that you'll do what I say. I can trust that you're going to honor me no matter what. Because if you won't honor God at $500 a week, you'll never honor him at $5,000 a week. Think about it. The tithe is a lot bigger. It's a lot easier to write a $50 check out of $500 than it is to write a $500 check out of 5000 Are you getting me? Y'all say, I knew he was going to talk about money. That's all right. <laughs> That's what most people have problems with, so it pays to talk about it. He says, let the Spirit renew your thoughts and attitudes. Put on your new nature. It's something we have to think about. We have to consciously make up our mind. I'm born of God. I belong to God. I'm His child, and I'm going to act like it. Amen. I was just reading the other day where the where uh, Job said, he said, I have made a covenant with my eyes. I'd never really thought about that before. He said, I've made a covenant with, I made an agreement with my eyes not to look after a young woman with lust. I thought about that. I went, wow. Job made an agreement. He went, here's what he said, eyes, you're not going to do it. Do you understand me? What did he do? He took authority over his body, which is exactly what we're called to do. And listen, Job didn't have the Holy Spirit living on the inside of him. He didn't have the powerhouse of the universe living inside him to back up his decisions. We as believers have authority and we can speak to our own bodies and tell it what to do. I love it. You can tell your tongue, listen tongue, you're not going to talk negative about somebody. You hear me? Stick it out, look at it. Point at it. Make an agreement with it. Some people said, no, I, I like being able to talk about people. I gave up drinking and smoking and running around. I'm not going to give up gossip. 
Well, if you don't, it's just going to kill you. It's just, it just keeps bringing death because it keeps you out of alignment. God can't bless you in the ways he wants to. He can't trust you. It's not that he don't want to. Listen, I, I, I would love uh, for my children to have everything they want, but I won't be giving my seven-year-old a, a pistol for Christmas. <laughs> She'd like one, and she can shoot one rather well. But I'm not going to be buying her one for Christmas. Do you know why? Because she's not to the place I can trust her with one. She hasn't learned enough and been around me enough to prove to me that she can handle it. You can't say, well, you know, you love Justin more than you love Abigail because you're getting Justin a gun and you didn't get Abigail one. That's the way a lot of Christians look at it. No. When God can trust you, he'll release things in your life. Until he can trust you, he's going to leave you right where you are. Come on now. Don't shut me down when I'm preaching. Okay. Let's go over to Joshua 1.8. I want to look at what God spoke to Joshua. Now, Joshua's getting ready to fulfill the call that was on Moses, which was to go into the promised land. And as you know, uh, Moses didn't go in the promised land, and neither did that generation except for Joshua and Caleb. Now, the promised land was not just sitting there with the doors open and going, come on in. No, the, the promised land was a struggle. It was a fight. There were battles to be won. There were strongholds to be overcome. That's what a lot of people don't understand. They think, well, I'm crossing over the Jordan. Everything's going to be great. No, if you're crossing over the Jordan, get ready. You're in for the fight of your life. But if you'll trust God, God will win all your battles. If you'll obey God, you'll always be in alignment with his resources. And if you don't obey God, you get out of alignment with the resources and you are in deep trouble. You can just go back and study Israel's history as they crossed the Jordan and went into the promised land. But I want you to see what God tells Joshua, the leader of the people, how to prepare himself and thereby prepare the people to take ground, to go in and to, and to destroy the enemy and take what God had given them. See, a lot of people, they think, well, if I don't just naturally get better, if I don't just feel better, if I don't start being successful in my business, then it must not be God's will. Imagine if the Israelites said that. If they just stood on the side of the Jordan and said, well, when, the, when, when all the Am Ammonites and, and uh, Hittites and Garbasites and all those guys, when they, when they come over here and they lay their weapons down at the bank of the Jordan, then we'll know God's given us the land. That's not what they did. They crossed across the Jordan ready to fight. And that's what we've got to do. We've got to fight a battle. The enemy is not... That's why the scripture says the gates of hell will not prevail against the church. I've seen people under demonic attack, right? The devil's just attacking them and they're going, the gates of hell will not prevail. And I'm like, what's he doing? Beating you with a gate? <laughs> the devil don't beat you with a gate. A gate's how he holds strongholds in your life. And the scriptures declare it's our job to run over the strongholds, knock them down by the power of God. Like David, by the Spirit of God, I can leap over a wall. And it wasn't no four-foot retention wall he leapt over. I don't know how he did it, but then were tall walls in those days. And the anointing come on David, and he would jump higher than any athlete you've ever seen. He'd clear those walls. Why? He was anointed of God. David said, Lord, you have taught my fingers to war. Woo! My God. This is a man's message tonight, praise, or today. Talking about war. But listen, this is, this, Josh was getting ready to go into a place where there's strongholds set up, where the enemy has held ground for so long, and God said, this is yours, go take it. And this is what God tells him in Joshua chapter 1, verse 8. He says, this book of the law shall not depart from your mouth, but you shall meditate on it day and night, that you may be careful to do according to all that is written in it, for then you will make your way prosperous, and then you will have good success. Notice he said, this law, this book, my word, shall not depart from your mouth. Well, how is that? Well, the next line tells us how. By meditating on it day and night. By meditating on it day and night. I want you to notice something here. God did not say to, uh, to Joshua, uh, you shall read it day and night. He didn't say you shall read it day and night, but that's what most believers think they've got to do to, be a, to win a battle. If I just read the Bible, I've been reading the Bible. Yeah, but are you meditating on the Bible? Are you meditating on the Word, or you just got some scriptures memorized? Listen, I had scriptures. I had John 3.16 memorized 20 years before I got saved. How many of y'all memorized John 3.16 before you got saved? 
You knew that it was true, but you hadn't meditated on it enough for it to take root inside your soul and snatch you from the pit of hell. But when you did, that means you had taken time to meditate on something. And that's exactly what he says here. It's more important how much you meditate on the Word than it is how much you read the Word. I dare to say most everybody in here could probably never pick up another Bible in your life. And if you would take what's already on the inside of you and begin to meditate on it, you would have a greater ministry than anybody alive. They, take your, they could take my Bible away. I got enough Scripture on the inside of me. If I just spend the time meditating on it, they'd never stop me, never slow me or you down. You don't need much. One word from God. Lazarus, come forth. Three words got a dead man out of a hole where he was already rotten. Three words. So he didn't say read the word. Not Now you have to read it to be able to know it, to be able to meditate it. But he didn't say to read it. He said meditate on it day and night. Put it before your eyes and don't just read to be reading. But find out what God wants to speak to you through it and then Plant that thought and stay focused on that thought. That's what meditation is. People are afraid of meditation, especially uh, back in the 90s, I guess, 80s and 90s with the New Age movement that was coming along back then. So if you said the word meditate from this pulpit, people got a little freaked out over it. Listen, meditation is biblical. Everything the enemy does is just, he's just robbing stuff from God's plan. And you know, all worry is, is meditating on the wrong thing. That's all worry is. If you're worried today, it's because you've been meditating on something that is contrary to the Scriptures. We are all meditating, I promise you. That's what we're going to talk about. I want to look at the definition of that word. In the Hebrew, I believe it's Hagah, or some of the translations have it sound with a D, Dagah, but Hagah, to meditate. That's the word that was used when uh, this was originally written. And I went to the Strong's uh, uh, Concordance, and I pulled out this definition, this definition of this word meditate. Meditate is to murmur, to murmur. Remember what the children of Israel did in the wilderness? They murmured against God. They meditated against God. So we think a murmuring is a bad thing, but murmuring could be a good thing. If you're walking around all day going, I'm blessed, Lord of God, I'm blessed. God's living inside of me. The devil has no authority over me. I'm going to love people today because love's inside of me. And you're murmuring that stuff. Y'all know what murmuring is, right? Your children do it. Uh, or sometimes if you've been married a long time, you do it. You don't murmur when you first get married because, you know, you haven't learned to. You say it out loud at first. Then after about five or six years, it starts going a little quieter, but you're still saying the same thing. Right? Pick up the clothes. I'll tell you, pick up the clothes. I ain't picking up no clothes. What? What'd you say? I didn't say nothing, baby. I said, I'll get the clothes. Right? That's what murmuring is. You know what murmuring is. Your children do it. Tell them to go clean their room. All the way back to the back. Murmuring's not wrong if you're murmuring the right things. Amen? So murmuring is one of the words. Here's another one. To ponder. Ponder. You know what ponder means? That's... It's an old-fashioned word. Old-timers used to say, you'd ask them, hey, you, you want to go, go hunting with me? They'd go, I'll ponder on that a little while. Ponder on that, I'm not sure. Ponder, that's a weird word, isn't it? Ponder. You said a bunch, it don't even make sense anymore. <laughs> but what do you ponder on? I mean, that's, that's what meditate is. When you ponder on something, you meditate. It's, it's kind of... Stays at the forefront of your mind throughout the day. Another word, imagine. The devil loves this one right here. He loves to get into the imagination. To meditate is also to imagine. See, this word where he said meditate in my word, he's saying I want you to murmur the word. I want you to ponder the word. I want you to imagine the word. Next word's mutter. Kind of like murmur, I guess. And then I love this one. It says roar. Roar. Yeah, some of you know what I'm talking about. Steve Gonzalez, I think he roars when people wake him up in the middle of the night. Don't you, Steve? <laughs> roar, just roars. That's, that's, well, that's where the father gets to a place that all the babies, all the children in the house, they all get quiet when daddy roars. 
unless you just run your mouth all the time, they have no respect for you. But if your children have respect for you, when you roar, they sit up and they get quiet. That My children all know when daddy roars, he's not sinking whom he may devour, he's about to devour. <laughs> when daddy roars. You know, there was a, I was listening to, um, remember the guy's name on, on the radio the other day, great preacher. You might have heard this story, but he was talking about how the, the, um, the elephants in this one uh, village, a bunch of young elephants, bunch of male young elephants he just causing trouble just like trampling uh, crops just going out of control and uh, he said that it, it was just causing a lot of trouble these young elephants so what they did is they brought in some a couple of real big bull elephants anybody hear that story brought in some big old bull elephants in there and just put them right in the middle of the herd and they said you know those big elephants they just start flapping their ears when them young ones would start acting up and they'd start lifting up their trunks and making all kind of noise and they said within a short amount of time, those young elephants came right into order and quit being so disastrous. That's what's wrong with our country today, is we don't have enough bull elephants to, roaring. And if you're going to roar, roar the word. That's what he says. I, I mean, if you look at it, meditate on this. Roar this day and night. Let it be, when there needs to be a roar come out of you, let it be in alignment, alignment and let it be God's word that comes out of you. Like, not in my house, devil. That's a roar. Or you look at your children and go, that is not who you are. You're a child of God. You better act like it or I'm going to beat the devil slap off of you. It's a country boy way of saying it. You can't beat the devil off somebody. Yes, you can. Yeah. You, can you can beat somebody so long they want to get rid of the devil. That's how the devil ends up getting out, you know. The devil doesn't have any sense. He just beats on you, beats on you, beats on you, and just keeps driving you down and down. He's trying to keep you away from God. Eventually, you just run back to God, don't you? If he just knew when to draw the line and stop, he'd send most people to hell without much effort. He doesn't do that. He doesn't leave them alone. Just always beating on them. And he just beats himself right out of him. That's how I know you can beat the devil out of somebody. He does it all the time. Okay, so there's murmur, ponder, imagine, roar, speak, study, Talk and utter. You can look all that up in your, uh, I know you all have a concordance laying around your house, Strong's Concordance and the Vines Expository New and Old Testament Words. I'm sure all of you scholars have that. So you just look that right up. So he said that we're to meditate. And so that means a whole plethora of things. It doesn't just mean I'm going to think about it for a little while. What does it really mean? It means that I'm going to allow the Word of God to consume my life. Have you ever been around somebody that's consumed by baseball? Consumed by golf? Consumed by wild boar hunting? <laughs> Kendall killed a wild boar. It was awesome yesterday. It was wonderful. By the way, Stan Evelyn, it's in the cooler down there whenever you're ready for it. I want to ask some questions based upon what this scripture tells us. I want you to ask yourself, because if you're not prepared for battle, there's a reason. And the reason is because you've not trained your mind to be ready. Because if you train your mind to be ready, you'll be ready when the time comes. But we can ask a few questions to find out why we're where we are. That's a big, that's a big part of, of being able to get to the next level is to identify the level you're at. And most of the time, we put ourselves about three levels above where we really are. And we put everybody else about three levels below where they really are. That's how we maintain our... Uh, feeling of superior, superiority. Well, some people do. I mean, some people, they do the opposite of that, and they always put themselves three lower than they are, and they put everybody else three higher than they are, and that's also a negative thing. That's just as bad. In fact, I think that's worse. You don't have any self-worth. But listen, listen to these questions. The first one was murmur. What do we murmur day and night? I mean, if we had a voice recorder that was following us around all day long, what are the main words coming out of our mouth? What Are they positive? Are they negative? Are they tearing down? Are they building up? Are they words of faith? Are they words of fear? If we would just listen to what we murmur all day long. You know what you could do? You could get with your spouse, or, or if you don't want to get mad at your spouse, get with a good friend and say, hey, what do I talk about more than anything else? Whatever we say all the time. There's, if you, may not, you may not know what it is, but there's people around you that do, and if you're brave enough, if you want to win some battles, get people to start telling you what you're muttering, what you're murmuring, what comes out of your mouth all the time. 
and then you will understand why you're in the situation you're in because whatever you say is what you get. That's why the, the wisdom writer said out of the, are in the, that life and death, the power of life and death are in the tongue and we eat the fruit thereof. We're either eating death or eating life. So what do we murmur night and day? That's a good question to ask you. If you're writing notes today, you write that down. If you're not, get out some eyeliner and write it down on your hand or something. <laughs> that question. Write it in your Bible. If you have a Bible you can't write in, put it in a glass case and buy you one you can write in. Write right beside it. What do we imagine? What do we do with our imagination? This is all saying what we're meditating on. And we're told to meditate on the Word day and night, on God's ways and on God Himself and on His Word. What happens in our imagination? Are there things going on in our imagination that we would be embarrassed for anybody to find out about? Probably most of the time. For most people, they don't want people to realize what they're imagining. But whatever you imagine is just the blueprint of what will be built. If you imagine it. That's why when God came down... Uh, at the Tower of Babel, he said, whatever they imagine in their hearts, they can do. And they weren't even born again. Why do you think we have electricity? Why do you think we have air conditioners and televisions and chairs? Someone imagined a place that would be cooler. Someone imagined that you'd be comfortable sitting in church, which I'm not so sure I like that. I think everybody ought to stand like me the whole service. Why, Pastor? Because then you'd stay awake. Unless you're like a horse. If you fall asleep sleep, uh, if you fall asleep standing up, we've got other issues to deal with. But everything that we have today that's come into existence in humans' efforts has been because of the imagination. Even a lot of things you see on Star Wars and old shows, those, those things have come to pass today because someone imagined them. And God said it. He said if they imagine it, Nothing. So what God did is God came and he put a cap on that system where it can only go so far and it'll collapse. That's why no nation will ever get too big for its britches in, the, in this fallen economy that the enemy set up at the Babel. That's net where, and what Babel was, and what that Babylonian system is, is man's effort to meet his own need apart from God. And any government that tries to meet the people's need apart from God will only get so big it will collapse every time. I, they won't even understand why it's collapsing, but it's because God has capped it. He said, you know what? It's only going to go to here. Remember I said God has restrained Satan. He's also re restrained communism, socialism, all these things, all these isms. God has restrained them. They'll never be able to build up as big as they'd like to. Not until we're out of here. You don't want to be here then. Do we imagine what God says about us or do we imagine what we're hearing or what our parents said about us or are we just imagining things getting worse? Our imagination is a powerful tool given by God you can imagine your way out of your trouble. You can imagine that you're not scared. You can imagine that you're not, um, that you're not broke. You can imagine that you make the right decisions. You can imagine that you're serving God with passion. You can imagine these things, and these things, these blueprints will begin to form inside of you, and without you even knowing it, you will begin to operate in that realm. That's why, that's why like pornography and, and those things are so terrible. It's because they're all based on the imagination and it just keeps growing and growing and there's no end to it. And, and if a person doesn't put a stop to it, they'll end up like the guys that became the serial killer. Just, they, they can't go far enough. Sin, sin just, just takes a hold of them to such a degree that, that they can't ever find satisfaction anymore. What happened? The, the battle was given up. There's no battle in the mind ever anymore. I like to, I like, uh, sometimes I'll describe people. Somebody asked me about someone, maybe in spiritual... Uh, uh, spiritual setting, you know, maybe another pastor will say, well, what about so-and-so? And so and i will say, well, here's the difference between me and them. I struggle, they don't. You know what that means? That means I struggle to stay where God wants me, and that person doesn't ever struggle. They just go wherever. There's no struggle in their life. I do what I know is right. They do whatever they want to do. And your imagination is what leads us that direction. So what do we murmur day and night? What do we imagine day and night? What's the last thought on our mind when we get up or when we go to bed and the first thought when we wake up? What do we roar? I know some of you roar. I've heard you. But what do you roar? There's nothing wrong with roaring. But when you're roaring the wrong thing, 
It's destructive. It's hurtful. It's damaging. Satan is the... He, he roars looking for someone to devour. That means he brings things in our life that just yell at us. They just they roar. Situations in our life that seem uh, insurmountable. They, they seem like we can't overcome them. There's no way we can meet the budget. There's no way we can... There's no way we can uh, do what God's called us to do. It's the roar of Satan. And what we have to do is we have to roar back with the word of God. We have to roar with God all things are possible. We have to roar the word. We have to imagine the word. We have to murmur the word. So we roar. We also speak. That's daily talk. What do we talk about all day long? We got into that with murmuring. And the last one it says, uh, the last description given was study. When I, in the 80s, somebody would come up and say, what, what you doing? We'd say, I ain't studying you. Y'all remember that? In the 80s? I'm not studying you. Do they still say that? Okay. They don't say it anymore? Well, I mean, that, that actually made sense. Apart, I mean, compared to some of the things kids say today, it actually made sense to say, I'm not studying you. In other words, today they would say, I'm not creeping you. How many of y'all know what creeping a wall is? Anybody know what creeping a wall is? Raise your hand. I want to see how many people know what creeping a wall is. You're creeping my wall, if a kid says that to you. Creeping my wall. Anybody? Nobody. See, they got their own language. These kids do. I'll tell you what it is. How many of you want to know what creeping your wall is? Three of you. That's not enough. I'm not going to say. There's a few. Okay. Creeping your wall is when a parent gets on a Facebook page of their kids and starts looking at the wall and how things are posted. Creeping my wall. Listen, not only will I creep your wall, I will destroy your wall. <laughs> I'll take the password to your wall and I'll yeah. throw it into oblivion and you'll never have another wall again. <laughs> Except the four in your bedroom. See what I'm saying? That's creeping their wall. And by the way, you better be creeping their walls. Yeah. You better be studying your children. So study, study is not, most of us get scared when we hear that word, especially people like me. I don't like studying. But when you understand what study is at its base, it's whatever we give attention to. You know, when you, when you started dating your spouse or your significant other, what well, you studied them. You found out what they liked, what they didn't like. Unless you just didn't care what they liked or didn't like. <laughs> and if that's the case, ladies, if they didn't care about it when they got, before they got married, don't expect them to now. Because yeah. <laughs> here's what happens when a man and woman stand in front, and I know... Our young, beautiful couple here will be doing this in just a few weeks. But this is basically what happens when a young couple stands before a minister. In her mind, she's thinking, I can change him. <laughs> in his mind, he's thinking, she'll never change. <laughs> Both couldn't be further from the truth. I want to end it with uh, Paul's letter to the church in Philippi. Instructions to live in a life in Christ. Why don't you let this sink in? Yeah, let's not just, let's not, let's meditate, let's ponder, let's imagine, let's think, let's roar, let's, let's let this word come inside of us as we, as we read this together. Philippians 4, 6. Don't worry about anything. Okay, let me break that word. Anything. That means if it's a thing, you shouldn't be worried about it. Well, you don't understand. No. I don't need to understand. All I need to know is what God's Word says, and I'm going to meditate on that Word. Do not worry about anything. Well, what am I going to do? Answer's coming. Instead, pray about everything. See, if we talk to God as much as we talk to our cousins and aunts and uncles and husbands and wives and children and counselors, and if we just talk to God 50% of that time, we'd have 90% of our problems to disappear overnight. Tell God what you need and thank Him for what He's done. Then you will experience God's peace. When you refuse, you know, you can make up your mind you're not going to worry. You can make up your mind. Your mind is a powerful thing and you are in control of it. You can tell it what you want it to think and when you don't want it to think it. And that's what gets a lot of trouble. A thought comes and we don't tell it what to do. Then you will experience God's peace, which exceeds the understanding, and His peace will guard our hearts and our minds.
as we live this life in Christ Jesus. So you're already living in Christ Jesus. Do you realize that? You're in Christ today. Isn't that wonderful? No matter what, it doesn't matter if you worried or you didn't worry or you messed up yesterday, you are in Christ because you've been born into Christ. He paid a high price so he could snatch you from the enemy and hold you close to him. But you can be in Christ and still not have your mind thinking about it. We need to remember who we are. Every Christian who lives in sin is someone who is, uh, is not connected with the reality of who they really are. Every Christian who is still sinning and, and, and has made excuses for it, what they have done is they have um, lost sight of who they really are. There has been a confusion. and I, They're having an identification <laughs> crisis. And so when we find other believers in sin, it's not our job to go beat them up for sinning. It's our job to go up to them and say, listen, this is not who you are. This is not what you were born to do. What are you doing? It's what Paul did. What does light have to do with darkness? We tell people who they are. We don't beat them up for what they're doing. We remind them of who they are in Christ. And that's exactly what Paul did. He says, when you do these things, then the peace of God will guard you as you continue to live in Christ Jesus. Let's pray. Father, we thank you for this word that you have shared with us today by the Holy Spirit. And we make a decision today to murmur this word, to speak your word over our lives in whatever situations we're facing. We make a decision today, Lord, to imagine your word. We make a decision to roar your word, to overcome the enemy with your word, to constantly speak your word. And we give attention to, give atten or we give attention to your word so that we can have the life that you have given us through the power of the Holy Spirit. We give you honor. We give you glory in this place today. Fill our minds with your wondrous works and your glories. Help us to keep a mind stayed on you. In Jesus' name, amen.